York, uh, all the way from the Mojave Desert. And uh, I asked them why they're in Mojave, is because that's where there are rockets. So that might give you a hint what they're going to talk about. Good luck, folks. Thank you. Give them a welcome. Turn on the mic and turn it off. There you go. Perfect. So this is Kaylee Shera. She works on all the electronics hardware at Carbon Origins. That's Peter. He works on software and hardware for rockets. Uh, you'll see Donna Torrio right there. She's taking video. She works on hardware for rockets as well. All right, until we get set up, because we have a pretty complicated demo uh, that we want to show you guys. Uh, we moved to Mojave about six months ago. We bought a house in the middle of the desert, uh, painted it all white inside, cleaned everything out, converted it into a makeshift lab, and we've been building rockets, flight computers, and data loggers. And it's pretty damn interesting. Uh, so how many people here have tinkered with Arduinos, um, have played around and made projects out of Arduinos and sensors? Perfect. This is a perfect crowd. All right, great. So there, there was this one time, still to get set up, there's this cool story that we were discussing just before walking in here. Because this is how almost all our rocket launches go. We have like six different computers trying to get data from rockets. And the previous launch, uh, we had antennas inside this fiberglass snow scone. And uh, one of us had a um, transmitter in the base station, and it was about a mile away because the rockets go in a parabolic arc, and you want to have tracking stations like at the launch pad at the middle midpoint and at the landing site. And the one in the midpoint um, had a different bandwidth, and, it, it, and we were fixing this when our clock was ticking down and the FAA is on the phone. It's like, you guys have five minutes, you guys have four minutes. And this is the same situation we're in. And it's pretty interesting. Are you ready, guys? We're good to go. Okay. Well, we'll start the presentation without the slides. Um, so we started developing uh, rockets about two and a half years ago. It was a hobby at first. And we were born out of Thinkbox. And Ian's right there. He gave a presentation yesterday about Thinkbox. It's a makerspace in Case Western Reserve University. And at first, we started building hobby rockets, right? high power hobby rockets. And uh, one thing led to another. We started building bigger and bigger and bigger rockets. And eventually, we were building rockets that were 18 to 20 feet long, had propellant that we had to get special permission to buy. And soon, what started as a hobby became a passion. And then now with our profession. Um, and we launched about 40 rockets when we were in school. And eventually, we got to a point where um, we were launching rockets that were that, uh, so big that we had to drive all the way to the Utah desert or the Mojave desert. So we're like, okay, let's just move there. And that's where we've been launching the bigger ones now. And uh, the, there was a rocket that we launched called Neptune about two years ago. And it took off. It had, it's a two-stage rocket. I wish I could show you the photo. It's about 18 feet long. Oh, cool. That's Neptune 4. That's our fourth iteration of the rocket. It's a two-stage rocket. Um, and it's about 18 feet long. My friend put it in as 18 feet of uh, 18 feet of terror, two feet short of insanity, because it was insane. And it had three flight computers on the rocket. It had a bunch of data loggers. All of them were off the shelf. We either bought it from hobby rocket manufacturers or you know, old uh, from old rockets that are being sold out. 
but it exploded and everything came back down and we had no idea why it exploded and there was a necessity to develop a really good data logger because we didn't know what happened and necessity is the mother of all invention and it's also the essence of the maker revolution and that's why we're all here. Fast forward a year, we started building another rocket and then we started working on another project called Phoenix, you know, coming out of the ashes of destruction of Neptune. And I'm going to let you watch the video of our latest launch. All right. So to put this into perspective, um, it was about 12 and a half feet long, um, made out of aluminum. It had a fiberglass nose cone with antennas in the nose cone. Um, it weighed about nine, 90 pounds, um, and it had a rocket engine, uh, and it's comparable to a Sidewinder missile that you would find on jet, jet fighters. Um, and it traveled at Mach 1.7, carried a bunch of our data loggers, our new flight computer. But what you don't see in this video is what happened after the engines cut off. So the, the rocket went up, went up, Mach 1.7, reached about 32,000 feet. The engine shut down, and the flight computer had a malfunction, and it tore apart, and it came back down ballistic. And that's what happens with rockets especially when you're trying to develop rockets to be super efficient, uh, you know, optimizing on mass, optimizing on everything you can think of to optimize on. So necessity for a data logger. So we, by this time, we had created our first version of a data logger that had about eight different sensors on it, and we had embedded these data loggers in different parts of the rocket, in the nose cone, the fins, the fuselage, uh, near the engine, and they logged data. They communicated with each other and they've duplicated data on different memory banks. So if something went wrong, we would be able, we would, we would have more chances of recovering data. And we have been reiterating that and we realize, okay, this is something that has applications way beyond rockets. In robotics, quadcopters, biotech, whatever you can think of that needs sensors, that needs uh, communication, that needs data to be transferred and it needs to be small. We had it, and we had designed it for rockets. So we kept working on it, and we now have Apollo, which was born out of a rocket data logger. And like any hobby development boards, you plug it in and boots up. You start logging data, and it was that's it. That's what we created first. And then we started showing it to people, and we got a lot of requests. People wanted to do crazy things with it. It had, well, we call it Apollo because it has 11 sensors on it and it's tiny, and it's two millimeters, a two square inch tiny. So if you look at, look at the circuit board, both the back and front of the circuit board is crammed. We designed the circuit board like we would design our rockets, optimizing on everything. It has six layers on it, it's less than two, mil, two square inches, and when it's flooded with components, it has over 200 components on a two square inch board, and it's insane. All right, so what are the sensors? First off, it has a three-axis accelerometer. It's really, really good three-axis accelerometer. Has a three-axis gyroscope. Has a three-axis compass. So that does all the motion suite. It has uh, a, a GPS. It's a U-Blocks GPS. It gets locked in less than 30 seconds, and you're ready to go. Has environmental sensors. Uh, it has a luminosity sensor that does visible light, UV, and IR. It has a humidity sensor, it has a temperature sensor, it has multiple temperature sensors throughout the board because we are monitoring heat throughout the board. Oops. All right. Um, it has a pressure sensor. Obviously, we want to get barometric pressure. We want to figure out what's going on in the rockets. 
And we also have a microphone. Why microphone? Because you can add another level of data to sensors. Most people don't realize it, but audio is very useful sometimes. All right, so we wanted to make the user experience of Apollo as powerful as the sensors on Apollo. So we put a beautiful OLED display on the front, and we put an amazing trackball. So if you're going through the menu system, you have data displaying on the, tra on the screen, and you can go through the menu with the trackball. It has a speaker for uh, feedback. Uh, it has battery management built in. You can plug any lithium battery, and it'll charge it. We have thought about everything when we're designing this. Uh, it has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on the board. It's two square inches. It has 11 sensors, has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. <laughs> And if you don't want to use it over the internet, uh, you, if you don't want to access the internet, you don't want to log it on your phone or transmit it over Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, you can log it on an SD card. There's a slot, SD card slot right underneath the screen where you can plug an SD card and you're good to go. So we have a demo. We, we want to show you how Apollo looks like in real life. All right. So if you look at the, uh, we have tech problems. Uh, so that's that's Apollo, and that's it's boot up. It's beautiful. Look at the screen. It looks so clear. <laughs> and you you see that white ball. That's a trackball. And right underneath the trackball, you have a, a speaker which acts. It has two different functions. One, you get tactile feedback because it's vibrating, the trackball, and it gives you audio feedback. And right now, she is transmitting all the sensor data onto the screen. I know you guys can't see it that well, you know, tech problems. But you should come to our booth at Maker Faire, and you can get a hands-on demo. All right. We have an HDMI switcher, and it's not working. So we have to switch it manually. So how do we make it this small? Because, because it's 11 sensors, right? ton of circuitry and a lot of heat. There's a really powerful processor on board which is managing all of these sensors. There are wi there's a Wi-Fi module, really powerful Wi-Fi module, which gets really hot. So we had to think outside the box, like we've been taught at CASE, and think box. Um, and it's embedded with a heat sink around it. It's a gold-plated heat sink that goes all the way around Apollo, except for the back, because the back has the antennas. You don't want to detune the antennas. And the heat sink draws the heat away from all the components that get really hot and emits it from the sides, keeping the sensors really cool. It took us a while to figure out how to get all of that, that form factor, and this was one that helped us to do that. So the horsepower comes from an Atmel, Atmel Cortex M3 CPU uh, running at 84 megahertz. It has 512 kilobytes of flash. Um, more, plenty, plenty of part to do pretty much any project you can think of. And when we gave this to a bunch of alpha testers, uh, people we know, they kept asking us, okay, I want to use this on a lot of other things. I want to use it on my quadcopter, but I can't access the chip. You guys have to open it up, open it up. So we made it completely open source. We added two rows of um, GPIO pins, uh, GPIO slots, and we're creating these smart mods, smart shields, that plug into these GPIO mods, instantly gives access to all the sensors, the processing power, and you can pretty much do whatever you want. And it's going to be an Arduino head hard product. We have been talking to Arduino, uh, and the entire structure is based on Arduino, and it's going to be completely open source, so you can write your code, put it on it, do whatever you want. That's, the, uh, that's Apollo next to Arduino Due. It uses the same family of processors, the same exact uh, specs when it comes to the processor, but has a ton of other stuff on it. So software. So there's this great quote from Alan Kay. Uh, he's a pioneer, pioneer in uh, software and hardware development. Uh, if, people, if people are serious about their software, they should build their own hardware. And that's something that we do with rockets. You know, we build our own flight computers. We integrate everything from scratch, which allows us to optimize things. And we follow the same, same ethos, so to speak, to, with, while designing Apollo. 
and everything is integrated into one unit. So we have a demo uh, of the software integration where we took all the, all the uh, sensors and we run one library. So you're not hunting around online looking for libraries. If you buy an, if you buy an Arduino today and you buy a shield or, 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 or a breakout board, you have to go online, look for libraries, and then you have to write code uh, to match those libraries. So we have one library called Apollo. You type that in and then, and then you're ready to go. It integrates everything, battery management, Wi-Fi, everything. We have another demo. We used this library a couple days ago to create an amazing visualization of all the sensors. We're going to show two today. And if you want to see more, you have to come to our booth at Maker Faire. Are we good to go? Essentially what is happening is the microcontroller is taking all the data from the sensors and there's something called a sense infusion algorithm that is running on our microcontroller that filters all the sensor data, processes it, and pushes it out over Wi-Fi or USB or serial port to a computer and you can use different visualization softwares to visualize the data. So Peter is going to show you visualization of um, the motion sensors. That's, by the way, an Apollo command module. It's really laggy. It's not the computer. I think it's the transmission from the computer to the projector. But you get the point. So having this right out of the box, do, being able to do this with the uh, out-of-the-box library that comes with Apollo opens up a lot of possibilities. Now we're going to look at environmental um, visualization. <laughs> He, ca he gets carried away when he's playing with that. All right, so that's logging data from the IR sensor, the luminosity sensor, the UV sensor, and the pressure, temperature, and humidity sensor. And as you blow, obviously, things change. Uh, these sensors are so sensitive that uh, we, we were able to measure close to one or two feet uh, from the sensors. All right, can you switch back? This would be a lot easier with the switcher. Okay, so Arduino Due. This is what you would be doing without an Apollo. So if you want a 32-bit processor and you want it to be Arduino compatible, get an Arduino Due. And then you get all of these breakout boards. And it gets really messy. You have a software, I mean, your code is, you know, clunky because you're, you have like 10 different libraries. It's just yuck. So, um, and, and it costs you a lot. It costs you $250 to get all of those sensors on a board. And it's big, and it's kind of not cool. So we, we thought long and hard on what we need to price Apollo for. And uh, after optimizing it a lot, uh, we've brought it down to $149. You get everything that an Apollo, uh, an Arduino with all of those breakout boards can deliver. Uh, and we'll be releasing on a crowdfunding campaign uh, for pre-orders for $149, and then it'll retail later for $199. So what's next? Well, uh, we are camping out <laughs> at our board manufacturer, which is Advanced Circuits, um, trying to optimize Apollo to make it even smaller. Uh, right now, it's two square; it's less than two square inches. We want to get it down as small as we can, and obviously, optimize on cost. This is terrible, but you get the point. Uh, thank you, and if you have any questions, we could take some. We're gonna do that after the break, but. Thank you very much. Isn't this inspiring? Yeah.